Hi, Hillary. Hey, Jackie. So I am trying to watch a bunch of movies that I've never seen before, and I need you to help me. Would you like to hear about a movie that I've never seen? Can't wait. Lay it on me. <laughs> the movie is Titanic. <gasps> what? <laughs> you, I mean, you can't tell me you've never seen Titanic. This is a staple of our time. So I have n- i don't know why I never saw it. I mean, I did learn about it in school, so I feel like like epic spoiler. I feel like I've read the book before I've seen the movie, which is a good thing, right? Like, aren't you supposed to do that? I mean, yeah. You, you'll know a very large plot point is, in fact, that the ship does sink, but... Spoiler. There's spoiler alert. I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to ruin the entire movie, because you don't need to see it now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> The whole point was for me to watch the movies. (laughs) I'm so efficient. Here, I helped. Thank you. (laughs) But there's a whole several side plots that you have not seen, nor do you know about, that definitely happened in real life on the Titanic, and this movie documents it so faithfully. Absolutely. And so, I mean, like you said, I feel I'm supposed to always guess what the movie is about. So I think a major plot point. Well, no, I'm going to... I'll go out on a limb and say that the fact that the Titanic sinks is going to be like a subplot. Like, cause I know the whole like Leo DiCaprio thing and like King of the world thing. And there's a necklace Mm -hmm. involved, but I'm going to guess that it's more a Leonardo DiCaprio love story than it is about an historical event of many, many people dying in a very tragic boating accident. I mean, Sure. I don't know how much you really want to, me to give away in real life, but like the fact that the ship is going down kind of supersedes a lot of the other plots in the movie, but it doesn't well, happen until. <laughs> I was going to say, for the sake of the history of the Titanic, I'm glad to hear that at least I'm going to get some history when I go watch this three hour movie. <laughs> you will, actually. There are some. Uh, notable figures that were on the boat that they have an appear that they have make an appearance. Oh well, good. Well, I'm excited to dive in and watch oh, the Titanic. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get it? Oh, All right, I'm gonna go it. commit a lot of time to watching the Titanic. <laughs> Sounds great. Can't wait to talk about it with you. Welcome to Jackie Watches Stuff. This is a podcast chronicling my cinematic quest to finally watch the movies I probably should have already seen. And I'm bringing my friends along with me. So Hillary, I watched all three hours and 14 minutes of the Titanic and I got on a lifeboat and survived it. I did it. (laughs) And are you changed forever? I guess so. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm proud to say I checked this off the list. Like I survived the movie, the Titanic, not like the boat, the Titanic, but the movie, the Titanic. I mean, it's one of those movies that I think our generation or anybody alive since it's been made needs to see simply for cultural awareness. Yes. That doesn't mean I think that it's a masterpiece. Although there are a lot of things to be said about it visually and historically, um, it's certainly not in my top 10. No, I would I would agree with you there. I mean, would I watch it over and over again? Probably not. Like, I think, I, I think I'm good for a while. Maybe maybe another 20 or so years and then I'll watch it again. But I, I think it was a lot, but I got through it. And that's how I'm going to describe that experience. You'll probably be like me, and you will only watch it when someone that you know has never seen it before. (laughs) Yeah, and now that I watched it myself, I would like to both apologize and like seriously thank you for going on this movie journey with me, because this is a... I didn't realize what I was asking of you when I (laughs) brought you on to this like crazy podcast movie quest so thank you for enduring another three hours and 14 minutes of the titanic oh it's all right is this your second viewing of the titanic or oh, more than no, that? i've seen it i've seen it oh perhaps more than three but less than 10 times 
That feels like um, a, a good amount of time to watch this movie. But, and and the thing is, you often see Titanic or parts of Titanic on like TV, so you just watch a little bit of it, then you say, "Eh, I'm done," and then you leave. Yes. Um, but I mean, part of it is that. I think part of the difficulty in getting through the entire movie is that the, at the, at the time, this was one of the first like modern turn of the century epic movies in a way, like Mm -hmm. at least one of the big, big budget. It was, it was the most expensive film ever made at that time. Mm -hmm. You can see the influence that a movie like Titanic has had on movies that are very long now such as any of the marvel movies or even lord of the rings back in the day i i feel like just the the scope and the budget and all of the things that they fit into this super long movie and still did keep it going at a pretty nice clip yeah you know there are there are long epic movies of yesteryear movies like the 10 commandments come to mind hmm. if i'm thinking about it where that they're is, really that long, a movie. But, but, but that's it's a slow movie or like ben-hur that is a slow movie even though there are definitely points of a lot of action and you know interesting stuff going on there's a lot of time spent on plot whereas a movie like titanic yeah it's a long movie but it does give you a lot of different things. I don't know. I feel like it, it goes along fairly well. That was something I, I did feel interested as I was watching it this last most recent time. There were points where I didn't realize how much time I had spent watching it. And then there were definitely points where I was like, wait, I'm sorry. What? There's an hour and a half <laughs> left in this movie. What? Yeah, that's true. So what I do every time I watch one of these movies for those who have not seen it like me, no shame. I attempt to summarize this entire movie in 30 seconds. Will you time me to see if I can condense three and three hours and 14 minutes of James Cameron's brain into 30 <laughs> seconds? Oh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> yes. Let me set my timer now and I will count you in. All okay, right. I'm ready. Okay. On your mark, get set, start. Okay, so there's this giant boat called the Titanic, and they hit an iceberg in 1912. Big spoiler, it ends up sinking. So we cut to current times, and they're investigating the Titanic, and they're looking for stuff, and they pull up a safe, and there's nothing in the safe, and they're really sad because they're looking for this big necklace, and we find out that a woman who is in a picture wearing the necklace is this woman, Rose, who was on the Titanic, and then we cut back to 1912, and Rose is super rich and hates it, and she meets Jack, and then basically the Titanic sinks, and they fall in love because it's basically Romeo and Juliet, and then Jack dies at the end because there wasn't any room on the door. Ooh. All right. That did was I, it. Did they get it in? That was Ooh. 30 seconds exactly. Yes. <laughs> wow. Didn't that even need to see the movie. Ha. <laughs> Could have done it in 30 seconds. I've definitely missed a lot of huge, gigantic subplots, <laughs> but I'm going to say I nailed I think I nailed it. It's fine. I'm proud I of it. I think you got, the mo- you got the most important parts. Yes. Which, which was were necklace, iceberg. Titanic, <laughs> iceberg, sinking. Yeah, Yeah, I won't let go. I didn't say I won't let go. Darn. Mm. Um, So I looked at because I I feel like this will come up a bazillion times, but I actually looked up like how accurate this movie was. And I will drop some like little sprinkles as we go through the plot. But like this thing was pretty good, minus the like Romeo and Juliet like love story thing, which kind of surprised me. I really thought it was going to be like dramatic but also like exclude a lot of things I guess like excludes things like class structure which to be quite honest with you going into this movie I didn't realize we were gonna have like a rich Kate Winslet moment I just thought they were both passengers I had no idea what a class structure thing but they James Cameron also pulled in a ton of real people in not real Mm -hmm. people well not the real people. Yes. They're gone. Actual historical figures. Yes. yes. That's a better way to phrase that, what I was trying to say. Um, and so I was pretty impressed by that, truly. Well, let's, I think we should just, I was going to say dive in. I think I already made that bad pun today. Um, <laughs> but that sale. get started. So I wrote, my first thing in my notes was, oh my God, I forgot Celine Dion is the soundtrack to this movie. <laughs> Like, totally, like, I'm so sad that it slipped my mind, like, going into this. Like, my heart will go on, like, shaped my young life. And it started playing and, like, whoo, 
that whistle. Like so good. So good. I know. I actually, I, I said it while I was watching it. And then I, I wrote it down in my notes to talk about that. One of the things that this movie definitely got right besides set design and, uh, costuming and such the soundtrack is on point and i will uh, yep take that Ever. to the grave i yep. will always love the soundtrack yep it is so good and like mm-hmm. celine dion is just beautiful in every single way and i love her and there's this amazing picture of her wearing the heart of the ocean necklace to one of the like screenings or press junkets or something and i'm just like this is everything i need and <laughs> uh, it's just I, I forgot how much i love celine dion until that moment so that was mm-hmm was super super good um and so that was an amazing way to start it but then i actually i i wasn't ready for like real life underwater investigation i truly thought we were just going to cut into like here's leo he's cute but we got like some shots of underwater investigation i will say i thought it was really cool that they used some of this big giant box office budget to go dive and investigate this wreck Yeah. And like, that was the thing. I mean, I think probably everybody, well, I can't go back to 1997, but like first thing I thought was, oh my gosh, wait, is this real? Like, is this the actual Titanic? And it seems like it is. Um, It is. They went in the water like a million times. Well, 12 times, I think. I I researched it too. Yeah. It which I, cause I, and I had to, because I was watching with my husband and he was like, no, no, that's a set they built. And I said, no, I'm pretty sure that's the real Titanic. Yeah. So I had to look it up to, to prove him wrong, which I did because it's the real Titanic. Ha, take that. And then they, and then they built all of these sets that were to scale yeah. and subsequently destroyed them. Yeah. During the filming like that, that, that scene or not that scene that set with the, the, the giant grand staircase and the clock. Mm-hmm. They, when they destroyed that, that had to be done in one take. Yeah, they there were so many of them. It. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and they had all of these people screaming and all of these extras flailing around in the water. And they had to get it perfect or it was completely screwed. Yeah, and that's something that, I mean, like, I wish I, if anyone has a hookup to, like, James Cameron or anyone on the crew that could, like, talk to me about, like, choreographing these scenes. Like, I know I'm cutting all the way to the end of when the boat is sinking, but... Just watching the background of all of these extras that are choreographed to like jump off the boat, jump in the lifeboat, like swim away from, you know, I mean, like the quote falling silo that's going to fall in the water. Like it's like Mm -hmm. pretty crazy. And it's all in the water. Like this is, Mm -hmm. it's a lot. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, it was pretty insane to see that we not only use the real footage of the Titanic underwater, but we needed to basically build everything to scale I read that we had to have everything, all the linens, all the silverware, all the wallpaper was all made by the actual um, like ocean liner company that built the Titanic and that furnished everything. So that all had to be accurate. And like, is that stuff that me as a viewer is going to think about? Like, oh, I wonder if that fork is the same fork that the actual Titanic had. Like, no, but attention to detail. I mean, I think that's probably why this movie all in all is so spectacular is because it is true. It is true to life. It is true to what you would have experienced if you had been on the actual Titanic, which these people basically were at that point because James Cameron made another one (laughs) that also sank. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I just, I, I think I said it when we talked about this, how you would like this movie before you started watching that James Cameron does a great dramatic movie, terrible love story great dramatic movie like <laughs> all true. of the scenes where there are passengers and this the actual sinking and all of that stuff I, I realize that I am also jumping to the end but that's <laughs> really that stuff was really powerful yeah the love story not so much but the the sinking and the the tragedy of all of these people and how ridiculous the cr- class structure became but everyone was still trying to adhere to it mm-hmm Well, that's what I mean, to to your point about love stories, like what's so funny to me is that like teenage girls were like blocking to the movie theaters multiple times to see this movie because they were like, this is everything. And now, (laughs) I mean, maybe it's just my like, is it my 
2020 vision <laughs> being in 2020 or is it now that I'm not a teenage girl that like I'm kind of not into like this is a weird story to me like really like we're fall like it's cheesy to me it's cliche to me like but these teenage girls man they are the reason why it was the first movie in history to earn over a billion dollars at the box office like they just love this movie and I mean I was good yeah. after one viewing <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's most likely what it is, is, <laughs> is an age and experience thing where when you are younger, you think you want something and then you live a little bit and you realize that you don't. I can point to other movies and book series, mm -hmm. some featuring vampires in quotation <laughs> marks that are Whatever extremely popular mean. with young demographics and um, as someone who is not a teenager i did not see the appeal whatsoever in such a love story and yeah. i think that same concept can be applied here where you're looking at it as a woman of the world in 2020 and you're like yeah but girl you don't have anything in common with this guy and he has no money right and, and, that, like, is, and that is hard <laughs> money is a big deal at that time and like yeah ugh, i have comments about it for later with this money marriage crazy town but we should probably continue this. I just realized all we've talked about is the fact that there was a Titanic underwater, which I'm not mad about because there is well, a lot. We're staying on topic. We're talking about yes. how relevant the sets and music and. And it so was like, yes, so, it really so was. was. I think I should have For a whole sure. separate, maybe a bonus episode where we will just talk about Celine Dion generally. because <laughs> She deserves her own podcast episode. Or an entire Ooh. podcast. Yes, absolutely. My heart will go on a mm. podcast about Celine Dion. Perfect. But we find out pretty quickly that these researchers are just grave robbers because they're looking for a safe and they pull it up and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they open it and there is litter. There's just mud and just destroyed paper in it. And spoiler, we find out much later in the movie what that stuff actually is. But we also find the photo of all photos. It is a I woman. Mean, it's not a photo. No, it's a Not drawing. A I'm sorry, a drawing, an image, a picture. <laughs> to end all photos, it is a woman naked, laying on a couch, all sexy and hot, with the heart of the ocean necklace. Dun dun dun. And then, of course, we cut over, and there's this old woman who's like, "Wait, what's going on?" Watching TV because they just happen to broadcast this. Which, like, really okay. Again, right place, right time. Rose, like you said, always in the right place at the right time. Again, right place, right time. Oh she, yeah, that's the she story calls of the researcher directly and is like, "Hey, I'm that girl." <laughs> and we're like, "Yeah, that works. That clears." Yeah, there's absolutely there's absolutely no background check. That's why her, her granddaughter, and her dog, and her goldfish, possessions. and the goldfish, <laughs> all of her possessions apparently yep. for the ship in the middle of the ocean <sighs> because she cannot travel without her pictures. Like someone needs to buy this woman a photo album. I know, so or like travel more conveniently. Exactly. And I mean, like, granted, it was 1997 when this movie came out, but I think they're like, were there digital photo editing things like at this time? Was Flickr a thing? I will have to look into it. But like, we could have. I don't. I don't. I, 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 no, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure we were still in floppy disks. That's true. At that point. And like the AOL startup noise. The yes. Noise. Yes, so she probably could have brought her photos with her on a floppy disk, but there's no guarantee that she would have had a computer to view them on. Oh. That probably would have taken up as much space as her goldfish, if not more. The, the good old days. <laughs> the good old days. Yes. Uh, but it basically just sets up, like, let me go back in time. And they have this really uncomfortable moment where the researchers are pretty much like, yeah, we're kind of just here for the necklace. Like, can you can you give it to us like what's going on and then thankfully by the end we actually are like oh that was a really beautiful story and we don't even like think about the necklace i guess but whatever i want to just... talk about how i was unimpressed with how they opened the safe and just pawed through everything like if you're truly scientists interested in history shouldn't you be like carefully removing this paper probably instead of just Flopping it on the deck like it means nothing. Yeah. And like I have no experience with like recovering paper from under the sea that has been there for several decades. But 
I agree. Like, I feel like if I were trying to get anything out of there, I wouldn't be like a man handling it when it was in such fragile condition. But it also, I mean, I don't know if they were going for this, but on a much deeper level, it shows like their only priority was that necklace. <laughs> like they cared about yeah. nothing else. And so knowing that this thing hope like wouldn't dissolve like this paper, they're like, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. Not the necklace, not the necklace, not the necklace, like hundreds of thousands of dollars in like bills, but it's fine. Like necklace, necklace, necklace. Mm-hmm. So priorities man you never know what you would find i know but you'd think that everything from the titanic would be worth a buttload of money That's not true. just because of the ocean although the heart of the ocean was in fact worth several buttloads of money yes yeah many 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 and it is interesting too because like like you said everything is so valued from this like historic shipwreck that they just like pass by everything else when they're under there they're like where's the safe where's the safe where's the safe yeah expensive chandelier exactly you're passing over the the clock that was stopped at the exact moment of sinking by victor Mm harbor you know it's it yeah to me i would have i mean again they're trying to drive home where's the heart of the ocean but i think that it would have been just as powerful if they had perhaps come at it at an angle of we're just interested in all of this history right and that's the one thing I actually don't know is the accuracy of all of that like the idea of these researcher of any like true historic like researcher doing these dives for the sake of essentially grave robbing like grave robbing is not like an expensive feat right like you're not going to invest a ton of money in the technology to go several thousand leagues under the sea to just steal stuff like that's not that's not really how that works so is this like do researchers now just have this bad rap of like oh you're only in it to steal stuff out of boats (laughs) yeah i don't know i guess i mean but i do guess that's how storage wars works so or whatever just kind of the same right and it's it's not like going down to the titanic is like going into a pyramid like you're not doing a ton of research on what life was like in those days because we already know what life was like in those days and we know who was on the boat and we know what the Mm -hmm. cabins looked like and all of that but i also imagine that they could have gotten some sort of compensation for hey this fork is from the titanic want to put it in your museum Mm -hmm. so yep but unfortunately they find nothing Um, But then we get to go back in time where we see all the hubbub and all the rich people. Kate Winslet enters with her fiance, truly thought for a long time it was her stepfather. My bad. Um, I don't know if that was intentional or not, because we obviously learn later that he's kind of a jerk. And when I say kind of, I mean, he's a giant jerk to her. Oh, yeah. Callous trash. Yeah, he's a miserable human. And so truly, I thought it was like, her stepfather because he said to Kate uh, I keep calling her Kate I'm gonna keep calling her Kate Winslet um he says to Rose's mother like your daughter blah 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 I'm like oh it must be the stepfather because he's constantly on this woman's arm but no no that's the fiance that feels right feels real real gross um so we just basically established that this family is super rich and then it's intercut with like Leo DiCaprio as Jack Dawson winning tickets for him and his Italian bro onto the titanic they're super poor they get in a fight it's like this we're setting up the scene for like star-crossed lovers class craziness um but then they get on the boat and that's super fast it's just like oh yeah by the way my favorite point is we we see jack dawson and fabrizio running because they're so scared they're gonna miss this boat they're like no no no, we're coming we're coming and jack shows him the the guy the tickets and says we're american both of us and then they both get on the boat like amazing (laughs) amazing TSA was not a thing yet. Nope. We've come so far. Hard no. Like, oh man, what a what a moment to really really set the scene of of what time it was in the world. Early 1900s, man. You did not need a passport, that is for sure. Well, you also did not need your ticket to be verified yours or have any sort of documentation verifying your identity. You just needed a ticket. Yeah, no, it was just like it didn't even I mean, you couldn't even like you didn't have to verify the ticket. There was no like bloop, bloop ticket master scanner guy. Like as you enter the boat, like it was just like, here's this piece of paper that looks like a ticket. I purchased this. I I, kind of, I guess he purchased it technically. 
he had to put some money towards it and then got it all back in a poker game because that's how this works but his his character his character like kind of backstory is not really laid out very well in the beginning it's just like oh who's this guy who's playing poker okay he doesn't have money i guess swedes beat him up we're not really sure but then he gets on the boat his his function is not to have the fleshed out backstory that she does because she sure does yes oh my goodness you you know her whole history but you don't need to know Jax because he is more or less her ticket out and he doesn't really need you don't need a lot of details about him they're not important i guess yeah we get like very little about him which i mean and it's so funny that we're talking about the fact that there's barely no back, barely backstory for Jack because everybody loves him at the end. And I think it's only because it's like he's the only like semi nice male character that we see because all the other men are pretty evil, like or yeah, perceived to be right. Like, I mean, yeah, Cal there's Jack miserable. and there's Victor Carver, Garber, yeah, and pretty that's much. it. And yeah. that's it. Oh, and the captain, we like Theoden, we do like the captain. Um, but yeah, everyone else is like kind of miserable. Like we don't like the weird henchmen for Cal. The, I mean, we like some of the third class dudes that Jack is friends with, I guess. And we're sad when yeah. one of them gets shot. But, you know, I mean, it's like he's just the nicest guy around, which isn't always a good thing. But he's a nice dude. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, and I can't, oh, I just, I just looked at my notes. I can't miss one of the iconic moments of Titanic when Jack runs to the front of the ship and screams, I'm king of the world. And that's like, you know, just at the whole, the whole ocean's in front of him. Have you ever yes. done that on a boat? Every single time. Yes. I mean, why wouldn't I? That is true. <laughs> well, I guess my my thing watching that I was like oh they allow people just anywhere they want on yes. this ship oh my goodness because yes he just because really everyone seems to just be able to go to the very front and stand on top of this boat or on the back and stand on top of this boat and no one's there to watch right they really have more like security when it comes to the division of the classes as compared to just like general security on this boat, which is so interesting because like there's gates between like the low deck and top deck, but otherwise it's like, do whatever you want. You want to go steer the ship for a little bit? Come on in. Like, all right. (laughs) Yeah. Insane. Um, But then we finally have the moment where Jack sees Rose for the first time. And then Celine Dion lightly plays in the background again. Perfect. Mm -hmm. But Rose, like, gets basically fed up at dinner which doesn't surprise me because cal is like "Uh, i'm gonna be a total ass to you and like pulls her cigarette out of her mouth and like puts it out and i think she just has this moment of like i don't want this to be my life anymore which like go ahead rose do it and then basically she decides like there is no way out i'm just going to jump off this boat which whoo man heavy real heavy it happens so fast if you're gonna pick a way to go in 1912, jumping off the back of a rapidly moving ship is one way to completely screw with the minds of everybody who's there with you because they are not going to know where you are that at is, all. That is very true. Like, you can't, first of all, you could easily lose somebody on this boat without jumping off of it because it is so huge. But that is a very, very good point. But I did not expect a, like, whether it was for sh- just a moment of pure passion or serious contemplation of suicide. It got real heavy, real fast. And it was kind of one of those things. It's like, Oh, like you have everything perceivably, except a very nice fiance. You have a terrible fiance, but like you have everything and you still like, don't like it. And it's, it's kind of like everybody goes through those moments and it was just like, wow, watching somebody do that. And then also, you know, of course, charming Jack Dawson comes in and is like, Maybe we don't do that. And she's like, well. Um, And then there's the dramatic scene where he's like, no, let's come on. You got this. And then she slips and it's like, oh, my God. But you know she's not going to die because this movie is three hours and 14 minutes long. Like, we can't do this long of a movie and have Rose die in the first, like, hour. 
that's not how this that's not how this is gonna work so well i mean also she's alive at the end of the movie that is true spoilers. because she is old well not even spoilers she is old that at is the true. beginning of the movie old so you know she's lived through it it spoils its own dramatic plot they needed some kind of way for them to meet that was high enough stakes for it to be memorable but low enough stakes that it didn't take away from the rising action of the movie that's a really yeah that's a really good way to put it i didn't think about it that way because truly when i was watching it i'm like why is this dramatic like why did this have to be why was this the scene that they met why did it need to have like such serious emotion like rose is contemplating suicide all of a sudden she slips and she almost dies like why do we need that moment like why couldn't they just bump into each other on the deck and you know jack could have dropped his like art portfolio and she could have seen the the pictures and that could have been the moment of like wow you're a drawer well that's amazing and like that could have been it but i guess that's a good point where they needed high enough stakes that (laughs) it needed to be well it also it also gave him a lot of insight about her and her problems very quickly Mm. And it gave them a reason to continue to see each other after the meet cute, if you will. Because although Rose is, of course, magically somehow an extremely innovative and open-minded and ahead of her time art critic, um, yes. with all of her Monet painting, yes, that she brings on the boat, boat. <laughs> and she brings on the boat, and look at his use of color, yes. Uh, but despite that I don't know if the art connection immediately would have drawn them together and then made them keep, they would have had to then keep running into each other a bunch of times. Whereas him saving her from jumping off the boat and then falling off the boat after magically tripping and then somehow just completely losing all her grips that gave them a connection and it gave them, you know, a very quick and easy reason to be invited to dinner and invited to hang out. And Mm -hmm. like it gave him, it gave him his ticket into first class, which otherwise probably would have been more difficult to break into because it was all so rigid. I wanted to talk about that first class dinner thing. I should mention that in terms of like other things that will happen before this dinner, like we get to introduce to the heart of the ocean necklace and it's like, Oh, it's the necklace. Even though we kind of all saw that coming, Jack does eventually show his art um to rose which is great um they have the spit like a man scene which is very cute um but this the dinner thing honestly confused me a little bit because it was like this weird kind of like oh we want you to come and then while you're here we're gonna be kind of rude to you also jack seems to simultaneously like pretend as though he is made of money and admits that he has none at the same time um also i feel like i need to talk about the fact that molly gives jack her son's suit and like the son is totally nowhere to be like i'm just very that suit is confusing to me like this was a very confusing scene to me i guess i didn't think about that that she would have this clothing that belongs to her son who's not on the boat yeah i was like why do you have that like i thought we'd see the son and i'm like that lines up like that tracks but it's like why are you bringing your son's clothes with you if he's not here this is weird All right head cannon she went shopping for him in europe that was what i was on her way back with all of these presents including a fancy tux for her newly rich son yes that is that would be my my way of excusing that moment but it was a little bit weird where like this woman's like very very singly on this boat because they call that out multiple times where it's like oh molly's here like she's back and it's like oh you have your son's suit with you like why (laughs) but (laughs) she's probably my favorite of the historical figures to appear on the boat because molly brown was an amazing human being Mm -hmm. yes that was i was really it was so cool to see that happen but also not to have her like take over the movie as molly brown and like try to be like look it's molly brown everybody let's highlight her story for 20 minutes like just to see it woven in like we see her at the end like vocally stand up to the uh sailor who's on the lifeboat with them and Mm -hmm. which is obviously what she's known for um so that was an interesting uh a really interesting way to do it and of course i couldn't not see joe from the office unfortunately the whole time and like i just wanted to see her dogs but (laughs) wrong wrong era i guess 
I know that you have feelings about this bit like a man scene. Uh, <laughs> I just don't understand its purpose, and they spent way too long on it. Yep, 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 um, yep. It's, I, I mean, I get that they, I get that they wanted to have all of the women happen upon them doing something unladylike and unseemly, but. Yeah, it was, and I mean, it comes back, like, she spits at one of the crewmen later, um, but I, maybe it's just supposed to be, like, a bonding moment and, like, oh, classes don't matter, right? Like, we're breaking down the, the walls between first and third class, like, but, yeah, I agree. Anyway, we're at dinner and Jack is, like, kind of in a weird spot because he's trying to pretend he's made of money for some people and then he's sitting at dinner and is, like, basically, I think he recognizes what Rose's mom, how Rose's mom feels about him and, like, how she is just, like looking at him and as though he is like truly scum and just relishes in it and is like yeah my life's kind of crazy and i have no money like it's all right um but the men leave because this is what the times that we live in that the men get to go and leave and drink and the women have to stay and talk about like cooking or something womanly and jack slips the note the make it count meet me at the clock note dun 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 And Rose decides to go. Um, So they end up going to like a really bomb ass party where it's like Irish jigs and chugging beer and arm wrestling. And it is just so much fun. And again, we I think maybe if we juxtapose this with like the spitting scene, right? Like we're breaking down the layers of class and Rich Rose like takes off her shoes and dances on the table and doesn't care about prim and proper, even though she never did. So we fall in love and then we see the evil henchman spots them downstairs, which I don't know how he figures that out to go look down there, but (laughs) yeah, that's not really explained that well, but Oh, well, I definitely, there had to be the juxtaposition of two parties to show the differences between class, because this is the part of the movie where they are hitting us over the head with the differences in class, um, where it will, well, and then, and then it takes a very tragic turn later in the movie where they straight up lock the doors so that third class class can't get up and even, like, have a shot mm-hmm. at making it. Yeah. And it's, again, it's, it's, you see how, how dumb it all is, kind of, where the, the poor people down below certainly seem to be having a lot more fun. They cut, I think there was one part where they're dancing like crazy and then they cut to the men in the cigar room and they're just standing there talking like, oh yes, the stock market. And Yes. And it's like, I so sure would rather be can. like dancing on the table and chugging beer and like doing some arm wrestling with a big dude than like standing. With, in- like jaunty fiddle playing in the background. For yeah. sure. More fun. And I'm not even that big of a party person but I would prefer that party. Absolutely. Jaunty music, fun party, lots of drinks, everyone commingling, and, you know, it didn't matter where they were from because there were a bunch of passengers from all different countries, and, you know, they were all united in excitement to come to America. A lot of them were going to start new lives, I think, if I remember my history correctly. (laughs) Um, They weren't just, like passengers for the sake of being passengers they just were excited to go Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i mean like you said i would much rather be in that party anyway um but the henchman whose name i truly cannot remember (laughs) i'm so sorry um comes downstairs and sees that she's there and he's she's wrapped in Jack's arms and so of course he runs back to Cal and lets him know that she is downstairs with the third class passengers at this party um and then we cut to the next morning and Cal has some feelings but before we go into how terrible Cal is as a person I think we should take a quick break All right, so we are back from our break, and we're back on the Titanic uh, post Rose going to the third class underground, not really underground, underboat party, as it were. Under bo- under deck, under under under, under deck, I guess. <laughs> underboat would be like with the fishies, and we we technically are not there yet. We do get there not at yet. some point, but not yet. 
right. Spoiler. Uh, such spoilers. Um, but it's the next morning and Cal is a terrible human. And I feel like we need to talk briefly about physical abuse because that is not cool no matter what time of the in the world we are in or what boat we're on or what movie we're in um cal gets super mad because she went to this party and basically said like you're not wifely enough for me and smacks her very very violently and flips up the table and that was a really sad scene i did not like that just to like scare her well i was here's what was getting to me as i was watching it i thought i I was just thinking, like, this was not subtle. This was, like, it felt heavy-handed. Yeah. Like, there were so many other ways that Cal's character could have been written to, you know, he didn't even have to be a bad person at all. Yeah, I agree with that. He could have just been, like, a boring, rich guy, and it still would have, the movie still would have had some sort of, you know, weight because that wasn't the life that she wanted, and that was Mm -hmm. the life that he was offering, and that was all that he could offer. But Mm -hmm. instead, we get this, like, absolutely terrible specimen of a human being who's just, like, crash and wants to control everyone around him. And that didn't need to be what he wound up being. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think it goes back to your... Script writing. Yeah, I was going to say, it definitely goes back to your point about how James Cameron can't write a love story. Like, he needs everything to be dramatic and edgy and life-threatening I guess to use a phrase right like like you said Cal didn't have to be miserable he didn't have to abuse Rose for her to want a different life like we learn pretty quickly that the reason why Rose one of the reasons why she's attracted to Jack is just like I like this life versus the life of being rich she barely even talks about or really expresses like Cal is miserable. I am being abused. I want to leave that. I am more motivated by the fact that I just don't want this rich life. I don't want this to be my destiny. But instead we get like abusive Cal who ends up like trying to shoot somebody later. Like that's crazy town. And yeah, he's definitely very villainous. I mean, Billy Zane plays it so well, like very convincing. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's like creepy villain. Like, I don't know why we, I agree. I don't know why we needed him to be the villain when there were, as I mentioned before, so many men painted as villains, right? Like we've got like Ismay, who is basically, quote, part of the reason why the Titanic sinks because we're going too fast. We can't hit the iceberg. You know, we've got him jumping on a lifeboat after trying to save himself, even though it's kind of his fault that they hit the iceberg in the first place. So there's already all these evil men. We didn't need another one. <laughs> yeah, it just, and it, I don't know what, if it was, it, it could have been handled differently. Not to be in defense of Cal. Cal, as he exists as a character, is trash. And if you are with somebody like that, you should not be. Get out, call yes. somebody, leave immediately. But it it's it felt unnecessary because, you know, by the time that he becomes murderous, you know, you're dealing with so many bigger issues at hand. You know, the, the true villain has surfaced and hit the ship and then promptly left again right the true true villain being of course the iceberg iceberg. (laughs) um watching it again i was like it might have been a different and maybe better movie if he had just been like oh yeah i'm boring or like way older than you or just in some other way not quite right and then you can see that it's you know like you can see the struggle of it more than what it was, which was like, I don't understand why she didn't just leave sooner. Well, right. And we, well, we see that immediately after because then it cuts to the scene, you know, after all of this where she's hysterical, we cut to the scene of her mother coming into her room as she's getting ready. And the metaphor of her mother tightening the corset as she talks about roses how she how she's basically obligated and is required to marry cal because they have no money like like you said cal didn't have to be evil for that to be a plot point like he could have just been old or boring or like just not the right fit and only in it for the money kind of thing like because this is clearly like a pseudo arranged sort of marriage due to finances 
but there's this weird minor plot point that we just kind of sprinkle in ever so slightly that Rose's mother kind of reveals that they actually have nothing because Rose's father, when he passed away, it was revealed that he was fully in debt. And so therefore Rose has to marry Cal. Like there is no other choice. And again, this is all happening as Rose's mother is pulling on this corset. And so it was like, Oh, the metaphor, like a beautiful, beautiful physical metaphor coming in front of me. Like Rose's life is just, she is not in control and she is bound by the people around her and the money. And that's the only reason why she basically has to exist on this earth. According to her mother is just to marry rich and not allow her to get become a seamstress. The life that has cho- been chosen for her is getting more and more stifling. Absolutely, as, you know, in, especially in this scene where her mother is stifling her. Mm-hmm. But it is, yeah. And, yeah but I, it, it it could have been done, and maybe if the movie was made now, it would have been done maybe a little bit more gently. Isn't the right word that I want, but just differently, mm-hmm. where. It, it didn't need to be quite that blunt of a right. situation. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess we needed a villain. Yeah. But he could have had the, he still could have had the evil bodyguard. He absolutely, absolutely still could have had the evil bodyguard. Yeah. And that would have been the villain. Yeah. He had, I mean, like pretty much anyone that ends up with a gun during a movie ends up being a villain, kind of, right? Like, so he had a gun. Like, he was pretty evil. He was trying to screw with Rose the whole time and basically, like, separate her from jack like we already had that kind of like controlling character but cal had to take it one step further um which is crazy but this is actually where the movie i don't want to say it picks up because again it is three hours and 14 minutes long there is no part where it picks up but it kind of like the snowball gets pushed over the hill i think is a better metaphor <laughs> like we've been pushing and pushing and pushing and now we've started to roll because we get all the foreshadowing of like oh there's an ice warning ahead and the captain's like yeah we're fine is miss like yeah we're fine and then we meet where rose meets the engineer and he says like hey yeah there's not a ton of lifeboats and she's like hey i did math even though i'm a girl i did math which is just a whole had- I had an independent thought. Yes. I did something really radical and I critically thought about this. Oh my goodness. As a woman, how could you? (laughs) She's so progressive. We already know that she likes art. Listen, she has interests and they're not sewing and embroidery. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So it's just unreal. But yeah, she basically comes forward and is like, I had a thought. Hey, am I right? There aren't enough lifeboats, right? And he's like, yeah, but don't tell anyone. Again, more foreshadowing. I, was um, like, I want there to be enough lifeboats, but right. I thought that it wouldn't look right. And we, don't, and we don't have federal safety regulations yet. Nope, sure don't. We sure don't. Um, and then we also get some more foreshadowing because after Jack confesses his love to Rose, Rose is like, don't worry, it's fine. Like, even though you're poor, it's okay. And then she says, if you jump, I jump. And then the it's not up to you to save me line happens. So it's just like foreshadowing for days that like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. Even though, I mean, granted, of course, I kind of knew it was going to happen because I'm not a 13 year old watching this movie, like presumably for the first time and not really hearing about it. But I wonder how much actual foreshadowing people caught in 1997 when this movie came out, right? Like, we kind of all know how it ends because it's such a famous movie, but were people really going to catch that stuff? Who knows? Who knows, I guess. I mean, you can pick some things up like saving and ice warning and, you know, you know the, the ship is going down. Right, That's absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we see a lot of that foreshadowing. Um, but of course, before we do all that, we get one of the other front of the boat, no security classic moments where Celine Dion starts playing again. She's just she's just everywhere in this movie. We have Near Far Wherever You Are. I will not sing it for the sake of listeners. Um, <laughs> they're on the front of the boat. And he says, like, do you trust me? And she holds her arms out. And it's the classic it closes scene. her eyes. Yeah, which this is terrifying. Let's talk my about where I said, I'm flying. It's a surprise. Like, you, you know there's going to be water, right? Like, right. you know what you're about. 
you've been over there. Like, you know, like, <laughs> but also like, close your eyes. I know I just met you and I kind of confess my love for you. But also he could have like pushed her off the side of the boat. Like, was she really like that trustworthy of this dude? Now that he like knows she's got money and stuff, I would have been a little more defensive. I would have been like, no, Jack, you close your eyes. Tell me how it feels. <laughs> no, but Jack, you close your eyes, Jack. You do it. No, you Jack, do. you. No. You close your eyes, oh my Jack. Goodness. Jack, Jack, Jack. Oh, that was so. Again, poor scripting. The, we, I, I want to go back to the confessing your love scene because that's really yes. the one where it's like, how many, how often are you saying each other's names? Oh my God. Yes. Like that and this and the spit scene. Like, I no, Jack, I couldn't possibly Jack. Jack, no, Jack, Jack. Jack. And I wonder if that was like scripted or I mean like I think anyone who's ever read any like Cosmo blog about the making of the Titanic has learned that Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio like got along very, very well on the set. And so I'm wondering if a little bit of that is truly her just kind of like being giggly and and being herself a little bit like being actual Kate Winslet and just keep saying Jack maybe so that she doesn't say Leo because that would be hilarious maybe who knows it's unreal but yeah no that scene was a little like all right yes well and also it's it's so it's so teen rom-com from the 90s -hmm. where it's oh you're a you're a pain in the ass but I love you anyway and it's like you don't know anything about her I know neither does she know anything about you well, like, and I mean, they're like 17 in this movie, supposedly. So, you know, they feel like they got their lives figured out, even though now that I'm not 17 anymore, I know that that is so not true. <laughs> so, and I think it's for for Rose, you know, she's finally, she's breaking free a little bit to cut back to like her being tightened by the corset. Like she's not wearing this metaphorical corset right now. She's flying on the front of the boat. So yeah. it's, a, it's a very different movie. Or a different scene for her. Um, but after we kiss on the front of the boat, they're back in Rose's room because we are still in the time when you and your fiance don't stay in the same room. Um, and we get the moment, draw me like one of your French girls, which I did not realize was in this movie. I put it all together when she, <laughs> you know, in the beginning when he shows her his artwork and he says, Oh, these are my French girls. I'm like, Oh my God, draw me like one of your French girls. That's this movie. So (laughs) I had no idea. I just knew that it was associated with somehow being sexy, but man, I didn't realize it was going to be this much sexy. So, Mm -hmm. you know, she was pretty sexy actually. Very sexy. And she is like, I want you to like draw me wearing only this necklace and, horny 17 year old jack is like yup in it um <laughs> have no problems with this. yeah he says lay down on the bed and realizes he said bed instead of couch and apparently that line was not supposed to be this like hilarious flub like leonardo dicaprio actively screwed up that line uh but they <laughs> kept it in so that's all you need to know about leo <laughs> awkward that's all you need to know um so super sexy super hot all these things you know we see her put the drawing in the safe which we find later um but then they are discovered and there's this chase scene and the henchman is just crazy and that was like that felt pseudo realistic or like not realistic to me because again the security thing like really we're just gonna have these kids like running all over the place seriously but well and also know. what was his plan for after he caught them I, who you know i maybe like drag them back to cal because that's his purpose in life apparently i'm i'm not quite sure but they run around i wrote in all caps why are we running through the coal room and ro- when Rose is in the most flammable dress of all time? Oh, I wrote in my notes, girl, you are a fire hazard. <laughs> <laughs> like she's wearing nothing but like light satiny, like flowing in the wind. And I'm like, we are, you are going to turn into a small <laughs> ball of fire. Like this is a bad idea. Like yeah, very well, bad. Again, it's let's, for whatever reason, just willy-nilly put Rose everywhere on the ship. 
Right. Absolutely. And because I mean, it was super cool to no see. Reason to- it was really cool to see. It was cool to see the, the, the control room working as it should before everything went bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like the only part that we hadn't seen. However, we could absolutely have seen a scene of that perhaps when they took, when they started the boat, when they right. left the harbor. Absolutely. Not, not just running through it for fun right. <laughs> and with laughing like, and giggling. With like and, a very, very flammable dress. At hundreds of degrees. Unreal. Yeah. And again, the fact that the lowly passenger could just get there, concerning. <laughs> very concerning. Yes. Yes. No security on this ship ex- until it sinks. <laughs> no, not at all. And then we're like very locked down. But, well, speaking of no security, they make it in this chase scene all the way down to where all the valuables are. Like, are we serious right now that, like, anyone can just get down there? (laughs) That's concerning to me. Mm -hmm. So they get there. And then, again, we have another scene that I did not realize was this movie, but I knew the reference, was the steamy, sweaty hand on the window scene. I did not know that was this. Yes. So they have... And I have to, I literally wrote this in my notes and I have to ask you, they have sex in a car on a boat. So what, Mm -hmm. like, I literally wrote, what is that called? It's kind of like a sex turducken. Like, that's all (laughs) I can, like, because it's like, I, the sex is happening in the car, in the boat. And that's like a, a fun bingo card thing that like you check off right like when you play never have i ever it's like never have ever had sex in a car in a boat like sure didn't sure didn't do that interesting it's just a weird the whole thing is weird there's a clever name for a position there i just can't think of it well i'm gonna then i'll just ask our listening audience to tweet at jackie watches and tell me what you would call this weird sex turducken that jack and rose have because we need a name for it truly Mm -hmm. and also i mean if anyone's ever done it i feel like that we need to know what that's called because it it should be a thing so we see the hand the iconic hand um and then finally 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 we see an iceberg (laughs) and i felt i will be honest i was kind of at the point of the movie where i was like hit the iceberg already like please just hit the iceberg (laughs) Like, I just want this movie like, to just start moving. Everyone, everyone die, please. <laughs> yes. And I mean, not even like I want the characters to die. It's just like plot development, please. Like, I get that we're, I mean, I guess the whole thing was plot development, but it's like, can we advance? Can we move a little bit faster? I remember when I first watched this movie as a young child of 10 or so, but I, despite the foreshadowing and the references and stuff, I sort of forgot about the iceberg part. I was focused on the character development and that love story part. So I think that was the intention Mm -hmm. that we have sort of forgotten about that. And we're looking hopefully to the future where Rose has abandoned her fiance in the middle of the ocean, which is very stupid. um, Yep. And is going to have to sort of hide from him for the rest of the voyage question mark. Right. Um, Like, we didn't plan out this whole thing very well. Nope, there was absolutely no planning whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but not that there was really time to plan because they just met. Hey, I just met you and this is crazy. But like, Let's go have sex in a car in a boat. <laughs> Perfect. Write a pop song. Um, I mean, someone will. Yes, I'm sure. But yeah, but, but by the time the iceberg showed up, I was like, oh yeah. Like... It's like, oh, right. This is about to happen. This is is about that big ship. Yeah, (laughs) and then it becomes a completely different movie. Absolutely. Where where we go from terrible, like, cheesy love story to extremely powerful historical depiction of sad nautical event. Yes. And, like, I have to ask, because we were talking about this on the break, this movie, when it came out on VHS in 1998 was so long that it had to span over two VHS tapes. And Hillary, you said you had seen it on VHS. I need to know if you remember where they decided to take that break. Because I I feel like this is the natural spot, right? Of like, hey, 
the boat's going to sink now and tune in for part two when we watch the Titanic sink. Like, good thing you already uh, made deep personal connections with these characters. I think it was one of the scenes where the old lady is talking. Oh, uh, that's another solid if any of you, If any of your listeners remember or I'm know sure or maybe remember. still have the VHS tapes, then Ooh. by all means, I w- I'm interested to know how good my memory from 22 years ago is but (laughs) that i guess would Um, make sense because it would have to kind of some be sometime around here and she does cut in and out i think it was around there and i think she was talking and then they come back to the old lady continuing to talk and then went back into the action but that is all i can tell you i don't really remember much yeah it was the fact that this had to span over two vhs tapes is just a sign that it's too long it's just too long but Mm -hmm. in any case we finally hit the iceberg and this is kind of where we're like cutting back and forth between the drama of how do we rectify the fact that we've hit an iceberg and we're watching jack and rose's relationship kind of get meddled in so we see like jack gets framed for stealing the necklace because uh Mr. Lovejoy, I remembered his name, the henchman, uh, drops the necklace in his pocket and frames him. And Cal is kind of in the know on that. And even though truly, as we've said this whole time, there's pretty clear divisions between the classes that would have easily been able to like be enforced. But yet we have to go to these extreme lengths of like framing Jack and then handcuffing him to a pole in order to keep him away from this first class girl. Like, I don't understand why this was the severity of the the way that we decided to do this but. well we had to add time to the movie or something that's uh, more time yes we need to at least make it three hours long um but but yeah so we see that happen meanwhile we're kind of like seeing the iceberg hit the side of the boat which is so interesting to watch that happen and then we see them people like on the deck like kicking around ice which truly did happen on the titanic pre-sinking and I guess James Cameron like hacked up that ice himself because that's how much he cares about this movie. James Cameron was really invested in this movie. First of all, did you know that he is the one who made the drawings of uh, yes. Rose and, and I, all of those naked ladies? I forgot um, to mention that. That is, I'm so glad you did. Yeah, we see his hands drawing the the actual pictures. Yeah. No, I need to. I need to divest shortly, or not shortly. I need to divest quickly into a discussion of James Cameron and how crazy he apparently was on this set because I did some research in preparation for this discussion as well. And I guess he just had this reputation of like screaming fits and like hissy fits and just needed everything to be absolutely perfect at all times. The movie kept going longer, like production kept going longer and getting more expensive. Mm -hmm. He wound up being like many different hats and did like every single position and also was a producer and like helped to pay people and just had all of these roles in order to get this movie out because the studio was becoming more and more disillusioned with it and thought that it would not be a success. Um, yeah well truly and like it's funny because the way you say that of like oh he did all these things it makes it feel like oh because he was just so passionate and like he was so passionate but he was also like this crazy perfectionist right like he was a crazy perfectionist and yeah and I was reading these interviews like between him and Kate Winslet and some other people and he 100% like dismisses everyone where Kate Winslet's like um yeah I was 22 and he was kind of terrifying and I thought that I was going to die and he was like well probably 95% of her thinking that she was going to die was her like part of her acting process and I was like oh okay Okay." oh dear oh dear (laughs) don't love that no there's not a lot to love about their accounts of him I'm pretty sure he was like would be arrested by a union or something um in a perfect world but what do I know I mean who who knows maybe he is better on the set of Avatar I don't know. But Mm -hmm. I digress. Because we just hit an iceberg. We did just hit an iceberg. And lots of very scary things are happening. A lot of things are happening. 
Um, and no one is taking it seriously, which is extremely frustrating, even knowing how it ends. Yeah, absolutely. And so what's also crazy is like the engineer is kind of like, hey, we got to go like now. And everyone's like, well, or we didn't, we don't have, we don't really have to go. Like, don't really, but don't tell anyone that we have to go. It's just, and this is kind of where the lines of how true is this. Um, and of course, most of the people that can truly give accounts of this this experience can't tell us now because they didn't survive the Titanic, but it's like, okay, did really, were people super chill about it? Were they trying to hide it? Or was it just because we don't have technology to like text people, email people, call people like, and again, we want to everyone remain calm. Who knows? But they're like casually handing out life jackets, which is very, very weird. And they're like, yeah, maybe you should try this. Just put it on. You'll look great come on out and then right as this was happening i checked and i wrote in my notes as people are being told to put on life jackets and like escorted out of the their rooms and to go over to the the main deck there is still an hour left in this movie and i'm like what could possibly take this long it's a giant boat it just well, needs now to we sink. have to go through the entirety of the boat sinking which took an hour an hour more than that and so fun speaking of timing fun fact the length of this movie is actually longer than the time it took for the boat to sink, like the real boat to sink, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing or what that says generally. Oh, we need an exposition. I don't have a problem with it. And they definitely did not cut away to from any points during the sinking. You see the whole thing. Every moment. It is every single moment. And we see it from like 18 different perspectives, which is kind of cool, right? Like we see the women and children thing we see the orchestra side plot we see the captain side mm -hmm. plot we see third class's side plot it's intercut now i'm just racing through this final piece which we don't have to do but we see like this intercut of rose saving jack so like we've got all these like half plots like running simultaneously um which is interesting i guess but again this is where james cameron excels and we kind of lose the love story even though we kind of push it into the Rose being a badass and like using an ax to cut handcuffs off of Jack, but we don't really have a love story anymore. We just have an action film, which mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. Well, and it's that this is the part where you're like, wow, they locked the doors against these poor schmucks in third class when the boat is going down and you are putting lifeboats over that are less than half capacity. Are you yes. kidding me? Yeah. So apparently that's kind of, like the part one of the parts that is a little more dramatized than actual history so there were gates on third like third class as compared to any of the other like areas of the boat but apparently those gates were used more to kind of contain the potential spread of infectious diseases which as we record this during a pandemic is very interesting but um i don't as far as I can tell in my preliminary research, the actual idea of like locking third class down in their like area so that they could not get onto the lifeboats was a little bit dr like dramatized for the sake of okay. the drama of this narrative. But that is not to say that they were not given access to lifeboats before first class. Apparently, there are a lot of accounts of a lot of third class passengers refusing to leave their luggage behind. So that's also why many died. But again, how many people can actually tell the real story of what really happened? <laughs> because we don't have a lot of survivors. There were a lot of people that were on the boats that have the accounts of, okay, yes, this boat was put over with less than half capacity because no one was really taking it seriously. And right. they were trying and, you know, that again, during the COVID-19 pandemic and escalating case numbers in the United States definitely rings true. Like, ah, oh, yes, we have a literal life and death situation and no one wants to do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, it's just this, like, I think it's just ultimately denial when you face your own mortality. And I mean, not to compare something like COVID-19 to a sinking ship, right? Because there's a lot of parallels, but also a lot of things that are different um, because you can stop a pandemic sometimes, but you can't necessarily stop a sinking ship. But it's like, oh, that won't happen to me. Like this idea of like, I'm okay. Like it, these things don't happen to me. They happen to other people and not even a class thing. It's like, 
I just do that does not happen to me. And so right. I can definitely see why many people were like, eh, it's fine. This is the unsinkable Titanic. Like that was the big deal. This is the largest vessel. Yeah. So unsinkable can't be. And it was it was a number of very unfortunate and tragic circumstances. You know, they sped up. The iceberg was there. They didn't see it right away. It was like they they kind of touched on it at the beginning of the movie where they tried to turn instead of going straight into it. There's a theory somewhere on the internet that if they had just sort of continued straight, they might have bought themselves a lot of time or only uh, damaged enough of the boat to uh, compromise the first three compartments, which the ship was designed to handle without sinking. So they might have stopped, but they might not have sunk, and there would have been enough time for one any of the other ships that they sent transmissions to to get there. And then ships that were coming had trouble finding them because it was so dark and the ice was still around and treacherous. And there was just, you know, thing after thing after thing yeah. that was happening to just stack odds against them. And of course, then there were not enough lifeboats to handle everybody and no one wanted to admit that there was a problem, at least mm-hmm. not at first. And it was just such a just such an English thing. Like, well, it's not a big deal. We'll be fine. Let's, you know, I don't want to create a panic where yeah, the American no. I mean, is like, no, no, this is the time to create yeah. a panic. Like sound the alarm. Like this is a like why is there no like horns going off that this is an Get issue? Moving, guys. Absolutely. Well, also when you think about it too, like I mean, truly my understanding of how the boat sank is strictly based on watching this movie, which I assume to be fairly accurate based on James Cameron's research. But the idea of like the boat gets hit, it's hit and damaged under the water. So technically the people on the boat, on the in the decks like in the lookout area have no idea they're like okay we skim this thing but we're the unsinkable titanic we're probably fine so by the time the people in the coal room are are saying hey the boat is sinking like that's a lot of time that is lost um to bring that information back up and then disseminate it to all of the the passengers and again when you have this mentality of like well let's not make a fuss about it like of course it's going to take a lot longer so well sure and also you know you're talking about how there's an hour left in the movie and it felt so long an hour is not a long time between the titanic full of 1300 people or so being on the water versus under the water like that is not a lot of time to get all of those people loaded and off absolutely it's just that i don't think there was a lot of time to handle everything especially because it was late and people were in their beds and the whole thing yeah and like you probably and i mean knowing what we know right like there weren't enough lifeboats to go around like they probably didn't practice drills or have a plan Mm -hmm. of what happens if we're sinking (laughs) No, is this is 1912. Terrifying. There were not a lot of uh, regulations like that yet, no if I drills. had to guess. Unreal. But, I mean, we mm-hmm. see – so the, the threat of the sinking ship is kind of intercut with kind of all of these other plot lines. So we see the plot line of Rose and Jack, which is obviously a major piece of this story. Um mm-hmm. Jack is locked in some weird basement compartment. Again, like, why and how do we have access to this thing? We just won't ask questions. Rose decides, I'm going to go back for him and runs down into the water. We see her wearing this giant coat when she's trying to tread water, which I'm like, girl, take the jacket off. It's like on for way Mm -hmm. too long. She like monkey bars her way through with an ax that she finds in the fire area and like grabs that and ends up going and finding Jack and has to do this like really ridiculous. Like I'm going to throw this ax over my head and try to chop this very small target. And I love the moment where she starts to swing and he's like, wait, go, go practice, go try that one more time. Just so he like, it's like, is my arm going to get chopped off right now? <laughs> right. Like, am off? I drowning or am I bleeding out? How yeah, do like, I die? How do I go? Right. Um, so we also see, finally, we, I mean, Jack is freed. Hooray. We're so excited. They kiss. Yay. Um, and Love it's a lot of like, 
it's a lot of running around. Like I definitely lost track of like, wait, where are you on the boat? Because they're like on one side and then they can't find a boat. And then they end up having to go down to go back around. And then they find everybody in third class and they pick up a table or a bench or whatever with a, his buddies and they try to ram the gate like there's just a lot going on in this Mm -hmm. in this part of the movie yeah well i and again rising action it all feels very chaotic because Mm -hmm. it was starting to get more chaotic people are realizing oh this this ship is going down and i am on the ship and if i do not take action i will be in the water which is very cold Yes, absolutely. And that's, I even wrote down like, wow, I feel very anxious. Like this is a movie and I feel this anxiety of people like actively fighting for their lives. And then the chaos just keep, we keep getting introduced to more and more chaos because people are starting to understand what's happening. Like we start with this kind of irritation of why do I have to be in this life jacket? Why do I have to get on this boat? And then it turns into, oh my God, I need to get on this boat. And then it's like ripping people off the boat so that you can get on the boat. And it's a lot. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, But Rose, they're, they're calling all the women and children first. So therefore Rose can get on the boat. Uh, Cal, very swiftly throws his jacket on her shoulders, which we know has the necklace in it um, because he very obviously wants it to survive, which I don't know why he wouldn't have just said to her like, Hey, BT dubs, I put the necklace in the coat so that she could like take care of it. Yeah. We were, I, I was, we were thinking about this when I was watching the movie with my husband and we were just like, okay, what exactly is the significance of him putting the coat on her? Because we all know everyone in this little micro scene knows that Cal doesn't give any dams about Rose or her well-being or her comfort or anything like that. So why put the coat on her exactly? And you're not planning on staying with her. Like, it just made no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Like, I, the, the whole mind game of it and, like, getting her off the boat in order to, like, wreak our weird, cheap revenge on Jack. It just, it, it felt, honestly, that felt out of character, too. Like, that was more yes. villainous than Cal needed to be. Because at this point, everyone is going to die. Jack is a man, so he is likely going to die. Like, mm-hmm. care about yourself and get yourself off of the boat, Cal, when you have this very easy and done deal standing in front of you. Like, I, Absolutely. I don't yeah, no, I, I thought the exact same thing. I said, for how greedy and selfish he is, why is he still on this boat? Like, we see all these people get off. We see the first class people get off. Okay, fine. Then we start seeing the actual chaos and the the kind of, like, onboard fighting and the escalation. And he could have just got, like, why do you care so much about being on this boat? And it just doesn't make sense. I agree. Cal, sh- Cal's character should not have cared so much that Rose wanted to be with Jack. Because he knew Jack was going to die. So he could have just whisked Rose away and been like, you're staying here. But instead, we stay on the boat. It was just a very weird. But again, we needed that for the thrill of the plot. Thanks a lot, James Cameron. James (laughs) Cameron needs like a love story, like co-writer, like a like a just like that mind to be like, well, that doesn't really track. The chaos is escalating. My anxiety is escalating this entire time. And we see one of the officers shoot the one of the third class characters who we've grown to love and apparently that person the officer is supposed to be William Murdoch who is a real character but his kind of suicide and shooting Tommy the Irishman was not apparently true or we aren't sure if it was true but james cameron just decided that was going to be a thing in history now um and apparently william murdoch's family like required an apology um for basically sullying his good name like it's crazy i did not know any of that insane so yeah there i mean there are like sprinkles of real people uh obviously as we talked about in this movie but i'm not sure how much liberty James Cameron decided to take with some of them. I mean, the captain, Captain Smith, obviously is a real person. Um, He did die in the actual crash of the Titanic, but the accounts of him going down with the ship as it was portrayed in the movie, like with him, you know, kind of realizing what was happening and going into his little chambers and just allowing himself to go down with the ship 
is one account. Um, another account is that he like jumped off the side of the boat and either to commit suicide or to try to save himself. Those things are are still up in the air. So um, we won't we won't know. Some people said he like died a hero. Others said he was super ineffective. So again, maybe the whole thing was just a dream. Maybe it was just James Cameron's dream. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. No, I, I didn't know any of that. I mean, I knew that most of the men who did get off the ship were basically had they had to deal for the rest of their lives with being branded cowards because they didn't mm-hmm. go down to the ship. Even though, as we've mentioned many times, the boats were not going out at, or down at full capacity at that point. Absolutely. So, you know, yes, this old chivalrous idea of saving the women and children first was in effect but if there's an empty seat by all means man sit in the seat right. i'm not going to judge yeah no absolutely i i mean th- i don't know what would you do if you were on the titanic today i don't know um but yeah no i it there's definitely tons of accounts like you said of of men being labeled cowards and then committing suicide at, after the fact which is just sad very sad mm-hmm. um but we do watch a lot of that a lot of people jumping off the side of a boat which knowing now that this was all like a full set and not like necessarily always relying on cgi like again the choreography is amazing like truly amazing Mm -hmm. of just all these things happening at the same time we've got things tipping we've got the boat sinking we have water coming up there was a time where people were sliding down the deck because the boat started to sink and i swear to god i rewound it like 20 times but there is a scene where the boat starts to kind of tip up after it breaks and we see a lot of the passengers just slide down the deck because of the severity of the angle. I am convinced that the way they made it look like they were sliding so fast is that those actors were actually laying on those little scooter things that we played with when we were in like elementary school, because I swear I saw some of those wheels on the deck when, when these characters were flying by. So that's my fan theory. That's your hot take. That is my hot take. Okay. Um, I don't know. I cannot speak to that. (laughs) I rewound it. I was like, I think it's right there because they were all wearing life jackets. So you couldn't quite tell like what it, what was going on, but they were very clearly like either levitating or on some sort of scooter apparatus. So I was going to go with scooter as my, my hypothesis. Um, Other, I wanted to note one other cool kind of, nod um, that I definitely didn't understand as I was watching it, but after researching it, it makes more sense. There is a small, very quick moment where we see an elderly couple laying in bed, uh, crying Mm -hmm. because their, and their boat or their room rather is flooding. And to me at the time I said, truly, I was like, James, we, James Cameron, we did not need this. Like, I don't, I'm still, I am very sad, but like, why are we intercutting all of these things? And so apparently that, couple was a nod to a true a true family to uh victims of the crash isidore and ida strauss and uh isidore was the owner of macy's and apparently they did actually die together on the titanic because while uh ida was offered a seat they did not want to leave each other and so they decided to die together on the boat so lots of little weirdly sweet it was it's hauntingly beautiful i guess is a yes haunting. just a way of it. it's it was I know. a nice little nod well we already had the i have in my notes the irish woman with her two little kids that was the the heartbreaking one yes oh my goodness i mean and that's the thing it's like we just keep seeing like you know we saw the the small child who was alone and didn't know what to do and we see these poor families we even see these first class families that don't want to separate and we watch the father just like toss his daughter to his mm-hmm. presumably his wife in the boat saying like I, he, i'm just going to be gone for a little bit i'll be right there all the boats are coming for the daddies next you know don't worry mm-hmm. it's like no they're not they're not coming mm-hmm. for the daddies next so sad mm-hmm. very sad so sad but eventually the ship does sink. Um, lots of stress. Uh, we see the ship break in half, which like crazy. 
Jack and Rose are on the top as it breaks in half. And as we know from the beginning, when the researcher explains it all to us and explains it to old Rose as though she wasn't there about how yeah. the boat sank. I forgot to talk about how dumb that was. Like, hey, do you want to hear about how you almost died? Like, no, we don't need to go through the science of it, buddy. Do you want to watch this potentially dramatic video? Like, no, we don't need to do that. But we hundred year old woman who presumably has seen a history book before and like knows how it happened already. Yeah, and like was there. And I wouldn't even judge her if she was like, you know what? No, I don't want to know. I wouldn't judge her for that. Like you were there. And a- apparently like really there because she was at the top of the boat as it shot up at a 90 degree angle and went straight down into the ocean. And what I didn't realize was this idea of like the boat going straight down into the water would create a giant suction-y whirlpool that would pull oh, yeah. everyone down. And somehow real smart 17 year old super poor Jack Dawson, like Dawson knew this and <laughs> was like, just kick, just kick up. It's going to be fine. Um, and it was not fine. Well, it was kind of fine. Somehow he makes it to the surface. Jack Dawson is apparently Superman almost, but he did die. Um, and then there is a terrifying scene where, and it totally makes sense after watching it, but I didn't even think about it, where a man who did not have a life jacket on tries to drown Rose and steal her life jacket. And my anxiety was at about 3000% at that point. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Unreal. Yeah. You don't necessarily, I mean, I hope I never have to know what I would do in such a situation, um absolutely but but yeah do what you have to do i assume it was just a well i assume it was also like a human reflex like anything that's floating i need to grab it Mm -hmm. and get on top of it to Mm -hmm. attempt to save myself here absolutely yeah so we see a lot of that um they cut over to as we talked about before molly standing up for in her boat and saying we have to go back um but we don't necessarily watch them go back um because you know they're like well they'll flip our boat over we can't go save them it's just like a very terrifying sentence to hear but they decide Mm -hmm. no we're not gonna go back and then we get to the thing that i did not realize was such a heated debate on the internet (laughs) oh my goodness i can't believe you didn't know about this i didn't know i mean i have seen i have now i am now realizing that i have seen a reference to this but i didn't quite realize this is what it was but otherwise i had no idea this was a debate i didn't realize that there was even like not to say it was an option but i didn't realize i wasn't super fiery passionate about it when i was watching the movie i was not like jack get on the fucking door what are you doing my instinct truly was like yo rose if you're gonna lay on this door why don't you give Jack your life jacket? Because you clearly don't need it. Like, that's the one thing that made me kind of mad. That's a very good point. I didn't think about that. So not that the life jacket was what killed him. He was fine. He just needed to be not in the water. Right. That's a good point. I mean, that's fair. It, but she wouldn't have known that necessarily. It's kind of like, hey, do you want to not have to kick your legs continuously? How about this life jacket? Um, So I have to ask you how you feel about the door. (laughs) Um, I feel like he probably would have died anyway. And like that one overhead shot of the two of them where she's on the door and he's like hanging off the door. I don't know if I think that they both would have fit on it. I, I do agree that they probably did not spend enough time trying. But at that point we were, you know, nearing what needed to be the end of the movie. Mm hmm. Um, but I don't think it would have killed them to make one more scene where he like swims around to the other side of the door and tries to get on from the other side in order to balance her out. And then that doesn't work. And then we all agree, oh, okay, this won't work. There's no way for him to get on the door. Right. Cause they try for about two seconds and like, like anyone I think who's ever tried to get on like a floaty raft from the water in a pool you always end up tipping it the first time. Like it's never successful. So like 
the the image of them trying to both get on the side of it and it flipping towards them like brings me back to like every time I've ever tried to get on a floaty object in a pool it's like that tracks but I agree Mm -hmm. like we didn't want to try a little bit harder and maybe my theory is that Jack did not think he would have died in the water I think Jack thought that oh I'm over the worst of it because I'm already in the water because he has a whole conversation with her earlier about the idea of like, oh, that ice water is so cold. It's like a million knives stabbing at you at once. Like he's already kind of gotten over that because they've been in the water. So for him, he's like, I can hang here. Like I can hang on the side of this door and keep her comfortable. I don't think he was necessarily sacrificing himself or like doing any grand gesture. I think that's just what he decided. Um, I did, of course, like go way too deep in a rabbit hole about this. There's like a Mythbusters episode on this. There's a very angry like Reddit thread on this. Um, (laughs) And then people, I guess, have like really bugged James Cameron about it. Um, And he is very passionate. And his his response is Jack doesn't go on the door because on page 147 of the script, it says Jack dies. Like, that's it. (laughs) Like, that's why he's not on the door. (laughs) which like all right again very factual so i don't know i mean i i don't feel fiery passion about this i i don't know if i've watched the movie correctly if i don't have feelings about the door that's okay truthfully i don't either i'm like (laughs) all right no he like was supposed to die i guess Mm. yep well then we get the iconic i'll never let go i'll never let go and then 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 immediately let's go she has to let go. Well, she technically can't really let go because he is an ice cube. And so she has to kind of like actively like smash the ice off his hand in order to let go of him so that she could be yeah. saved. But she and I has- want to make it clear that I understand the metaphor of like, I will never let go of life. I will never let go of my feelings for you. Right. I will never, you know, like I will never let go of my dreams. I get I get it. It's just funny. <laughs> It's just like, but I'm going to have to let go of you. I'll never let go of all those other things. Um, Mm -hmm. It's also very cute because he says you're going to die a very old lady in your nice warm bed. And that does happen. Um, Maybe. Side, well, well, I have theories on that. But I will say side fun Mm -hmm. fact is the actress who played Rose, old Rose, actually died at age 100. So she got to be. She did in 2010. She died a very old lady. I don't know if she died in a warm bed. I sure hope that she did. But she lived to age 100. So good for her. 17 year old Leonardo DiCaprio really made her (laughs) gave a (laughs) prophecy, I guess, was a a small prophet. Um, But then, I mean, we're kind of at the end of the movie now, right? Like, Jack dies. He floats in a weird way. We watch him float to the bottom of the ocean, which is just kind of creepy. Um, So uh, she gets saved. She goes and, like, swims over and grabs the whistle, uh, which I didn't see coming at all, but whatever. Um, I was like, how is she going to swim over there? No, I, like, didn't even put it together. I'm like, how is she? I knew she would be saved. I just kind of thought maybe they'd catch her on the on another pass or something. But when she got out of, on into the water from the boat, I was like, what are you doing, girl? You can't swim over there. But then she grabbed her. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're smart. I would not do well as a Titanic survivor. That's for sure. That is for sure. Um, Celine Dion plays some more. She's like super pale. Um, but then we cut back to current times and she finishes telling her story. Her granddaughter is sobbing. Very beautiful. I think what they should have done, which actually probably wouldn't have played out because I'm not a movie producer, but wouldn't it have been interesting if like Kate Winslet played the granddaughter of Old Rose because then she would like ultimately resemble her grandmother and we could have like dolled her up a little more to make her look like current. 1997 Kate Winslet instead of 1912 Kate Winslet but like I thought that would be kind of funny maybe Again, I don't know. I'm not a movie director I don't that's why I don't get paid for this I just talk about it it's fine <laughs> um but then we have like the full circle moment and she goes to the edge of the boat and she has the heart of the ocean which we all knew and she throws it into the water and that's intercut with her like getting to New York City and she says that her name is Rose Dawson which is like a beautiful metaphor um and then we I think she dies and apparently you think she doesn't no it's not that I don't think she dies but that is another hotly contested uh point on the internet and in fact the script 
I've never read the script, but allegedly this is supposed to be left up to audience interpretation, whether she dies or not. I was watching this with my boyfriend and he thought immediately it was a dream and I immediately thought it was heaven and therefore she was dead because all the people we see on the ship are, we've seen them die. We see the orchestra, we see the captain. I mean, we see Leo, obviously. So... I am team she passes away because it's like a metaphor of like she lets go again. Again, we let go. She said she won't let go. And then she did let go of the necklace. She lived a full life, full circle. Well, and exactly. She's full She's full circle. She's back to this extremely formative experience for her that like was the beginning in a lot of ways of her life, um, you know, as she wanted to live it. So it would be make sense in a poetic literary sort of way if this was where her life in fact ended now that she has returned and like come to terms with that story and told it and like made sense of it. Um, so I could absolutely see the argument that she died. Of course, I also see the argument that it is a dream because like it, it just isn't clear, but that's mm-hmm. it's, it's not supposed to be clear. Well... The world will never know. That's another hot take. We have so many <laughs> hot takes that we're hopefully my our listeners will uh, share their thoughts on the door and the movie ending. Did she die mm-hmm. or is she dreaming? Um, but that is three hours and 14 minutes of the Titanic <laughs> in less time than the movie itself, which is good. Um, and so... If you are like me and haven't seen the movie and want to sound like you've seen the movie, I think really things you have to talk about are, could Jack fit on the door? Is she dead at the end of the movie? And I think you need to understand what draw me like one of your French girls really means. The important takeaways. Those really are. And that you won't let go. You won't let go, and the class system is garbage. It is garbage. And Cal is garbage. That's another big takeaway. Cal Cal is garbage, but he got the ending that he deserved. He did. He did. Yeah, we didn't really wrap him up. He did. He did. He shot at Jack. I forgot about that. (laughs) He pulls a gun on Jack. There's a whole drama thing that we totally skipped over. But yes, he did get the ending that he deserved. But um, I guess I always I always try to think about if this movie like lived up to the hype. And I think we've addressed this many times, like because I'm not a 13 year old in 1997, I'm going to say, sure, like I'm glad that I've seen it. I I learned some things about the Titanic thanks to researching this movie (laughs) that I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. But really, I mean, it's it's a decent love story jammed into a pretty decent action movie yeah that's and a historically accurate one at that yes a historically accurate action movie with the always pretty leonardo dicaprio and kate winslet and i was gonna say the magnificent kate winslet these it's um it's like other movies that i could name where the (laughs) actors are too good for the movie Yes, and you I mean, realize. Like, yes, yeah, and, and you I realize this know. well after the fact. Right, I was gonna say I know that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio apparently did not want this role, <laughs> and I get it. Ah, but Kate Winslet campaigned extremely hard for it. Yes, which for, is for so hers. interesting. Yeah, it's so so interesting. I mean, I'm not in this industry at all, so I I guess I can't relate, but I mean, maybe like, it's like, you know, you see a job on the internet, a posting, and you're like, I want that job no matter what, and so I get it, I guess, and I mean, it was, it would definitely help their careers. I mean, Leo Mania was already happening at this time anyway, so he didn't necessarily need this for his, like, clout in the world, but, you know, if you have a great movie that's gonna break records, it's never a bad thing. Yeah. Well, Hillary, thank you for going on this literal ride with me through of course. the rough seas <laughs> aboard the Titanic, the unsinkable Titanic. 
And listeners, thank you for joining us. Um, please tweet all your hot takes about the door. Anything else in this movie that happens that you have a theory about, um, we are at Jackie Watches. And I'm excited. Next week, we're going to go a little lighter. We are watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Talk to you then. Jackie Watches Stuff is supported by our listeners. I'd like to thank our supporters in the Academy on Patreon. They are Jarrett S., Linda V., Brianna S., Missy V., Paul H., Tom S., and Logan B. Thank you so much for your ongoing support of this show. If you'd like to join the Academy and get a shout out for supporting us, visit patreon.com slash Jackie Watches Stuff. You can also support the show by submitting a review on your podcast player or sharing it with your family and friends. Jackie Watches Stuff is hosted by me, Jackie Vetrano, and produced by Sean Flynn. You can find Sean on Twitter at WXGeek. Jackie Watches Stuff is available wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can listen online at JackieWatchesStuff.com. You can also send us your thoughts on the Titanic on Twitter. We're at Jackie Watches. Thanks for listening. Join me next time. I'll be watching The Wedding Singer.